And we're back, folks, here with another show and your old Uncle Yo. And I got a guest for you today, Frank Rich, who's a, a guy I met at a at a seminar a few years ago, and we stayed in touch and been pretty good friends. And uh, he's got a very unique story uh, and a very awesome service that he provides for young men. And it's about helping young men get off of porn, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the foundation of what you've been doing here all these years. Is that right, Frank? Absolutely, man. Yeah, so for the last uh, three plus years, we've really been leading the conversation um, on the podcast and then um, early 20. So it's interesting, man, because, you know, I, I, I overcome my addiction, which well, I'm sure we'll get into maybe some of that here. Um, all I want to do is I want to tell everybody about it, like getting on the other side of this thing. I was like, everybody needs to hear this. And that became the superman life, which, you know, we're 145, 146 episodes in. We've had you on a couple of times, but out of sharing my story and out of having regular conversations, the need to help others uh, came out of it. So for, for the last two plus years now, I've really been focused on building and scaling our coaching company to rebuild recovery. Um, so we have books, courses, uh, group nice. coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, really helping men. So, so it's, we've, we've pivoted, man, because back in the day, it was only helping men overcome pornog pornography addiction. I didn't know what the hell I was doing back then. I was like, yeah, I've overcome this thing in my life. I think I can help you. But as I got into the work, I'd realized it's like, hey, you actually don't need to overcome porn. You need to become a better man. Yes. And in the process of you becoming better, you'll take care of the porn problem. So yes. our mission at Rebuild Recovery has become, we help men become better men by quitting porn first and then rebuilding their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like the way I started with workouts. And it's like, you, you have this insertion point, this place where guys need support, but then it opens up a whole world. And it really becomes becoming the strongest version of yourself because you can't have one without the other. It's a holistic process. But my question to you, man, is like, so what's the big deal? Porn is just watching sex on a screen. It's free. Why would anybody want to get over doing that? Why would anybody even pay to figure out how to stop watching sex on a screen, bro? Yeah, man. And I think I think the way that you phrased that question answered itself, right? <laughs> like you're 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 watching sex on a screen. So why do you want to be a spectator to one of the most intimate acts that you can participate in? Um, you know, when you think about neuroscience and how the brain works, so what, what fires together, wires together. And this is the biggest, one of the biggest problems we're seeing with a lot of the young men that I've worked with. So we've had guys as young as 18 in our program. I've worked with men as, as, as deep into their mid sixties. Those guys have a little bit different of a problem. Once you're kind of past 40, like it's a little bit different of a problem we're attacking. The problem with the young men though, is they've been brought up and raised in a culture where sex is taking place and they sit on the sidelines as a spectator. You know, if you were trying to, you know, become the greatest quarterback in the, in the NFL, you wouldn't just watch game tape. You'd watch a little bit of it. And, and that's what I'm saying is go watch porn to learn how to have sex. But you need to get the reps in because you need to get conditioned and, and, and build those behavioral patterns. So why would you want to sit on this? I guess I would, I would a answer your question by asking the question back is why would you want to sit on the sidelines consuming sex instead of learning how to be a man that can create deep, meaningful intimacy in all areas of his life. Well, is it, how is it any different than somebody who watches, you know, football game, right? They know they're not going to be a professional football player, but they're entertaining themselves. It just, <clears throat> it's fun. It feels good. I'm playing devil's advocate, by the way. <laughs> it's fun. It feels good. What's the harm? Really? That's my question is what's the harm, Frank? Why? Why stop? That's a great question, man. And, you know, I don't ever try to tell anybody what to do with their life. So the men that we work with, the men that we help come to us seeking help, yeah. um, you know, like we could, we could address this, we could attack it a couple different, you know, a couple different angles. I mean, I, we could, we could address it from a heart perspective, you know, obviously biblically as well, you know, is it a sin in God's eyes? Absolutely. Should you not participate in these things? Um, here's the thing, man, is people will put that front out there. It's like, oh, it's no big deal, man. I'm just doing it. Like, I really enjoy this. You, you ask that enough questions, you spend enough time with that individual, you'll get to the root of it that they're probably ashamed of what they're doing. Or here's an interesting follow-up question, right? So you have no problem with what you're consuming. 
let's pull up your let's pull up your browser history right now, man. Let's look at what you're let's look at actually what you're into. Because here's the thing, man, is most people these days are consuming pornography that if they were in the room while it was taking place, they wouldn't feel comfortable with it. So nobody needs me to tell them why pornography is bad for them. They already know. Um, and, and anybody that's putting a front out there, that is them avoiding truth in their life. And that would be a whole different conversation that we could potentially get into. Um, but, but yeah, man, I think, I think most people know, but my mission has never been around trying to convince somebody um, that porn is bad in their life. Once they're ready to get it out though, I'm the guy that's gonna help them. What complaint do these men come to you with though? The ones that are <clears throat> wanting to overcome porn, what is it that they are seeking out? Why do they want to? Why do they want to overcome it? The right, pornography yeah. in the first place? Yeah, what makes someone, I've never, you know, the, God save me, I've never had this issue, but what does someone, what is that epiphany like one day when you're, you know, you're watching sex and then one day there's this idea that maybe I should stop. Uh, what's going on inside someone who has that sort of revelation? And then what is the outcome? Yeah. What do they want? Like, okay, so you stop, now what? What's the big deal? Yeah, I think the best way for me to answer that would be to maybe share a little bit about my journey and what led me to quitting. So you had great. mentioned that you and I met back, you know, five years ago in 2017 at a Dave Sharp event here here in Tampa. Um, you know, so for six, seven years leading up to that, I'd been, you know, running businesses in the entrepreneurship space. Uh, attending that event was I actually wanted to learn from you. So I was getting into the content side of things. I was getting into Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. So for me, I've so my background is in entrepreneurship, is in bodybuilding. Um, you know, achieve some some worldly success, I guess you could say, to to a certain extent. The moment came for me in 2019 when I had built a body that I wanted to. I'd accomplished everything physically that I that I'd ever set out to do. I had started multiple businesses and generated millions of dollars in online sales through our companies. Um, I had the eighty thousand dollar you know Audi A8. You know I dated all the beautiful women in the world. I had done all the drugs. I'd go, gone to all the parties. I'd done all the traveling. I, so I'd accomplished all <laughs> these nice. things. And looking myself in the mirror, it was like, okay, you've accomplished all this, but why are you miserable? Why do you hate yourself? Right. Why are you so unhappy? Why are you depressed? Why are you literally socially anxious to the point where if you go to a party, you have to drink before you even show up just so that you can have conversations with people. It was through that evaluation process for me that was like, we well, have this secret. So anybody consuming pornography, if they're not doing it and they're not sharing it with other people, while they may not be lying, they're holding truths from, from the people within in their lives. And if they're in marriages and they're in relationships um, and they have people that are close to them, withholding that truth from them means that you're not giving your true authentic self to the world. And you do that long enough. I mean, we're, we're seeing it with Dan Blazirin, right? Like he's on this newfound journey where he wrote a book now and he's talking about it was, you know, chasing pleasure is, is not what a man is, is, is to do. And he's accomplished really? all these things. It's really interesting, man. I think, wow. I think you're, I think we're going to see it. I think we're going to see something really cool coming out of Dan here in the next couple of years. So a great uh, episode he did on London real recently with Brian. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I think for me, it was the point of like, yeah, you're a fraud to the world. Like you're going out through your content and trying to tell people through building their body that they're going to become the greatest version of themselves. Well, why aren't you the greatest version of yourself, Frank, then, you know, if you have all the secrets to mm -hmm. this, why are you unhappy? So it was a deep look inside for me that started first. And then it was opening up and having conversations with people that began to change my life. So I didn't do anything radical at the beginning. I just talked to people that were close to me and said, hey man, I think I'm struggling with this porn addiction. Have you ever, have you ever done any, like, have you ever struggled with this? Like, what does it look like in, 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 in your life? And I think hearing a lot of men that I really looked up to and inspired uh, by just accepting me for who I was and saying, hey man, it's gonna be okay. Like you don't need to be, the shield, you know, you don't need to be the warrior bodybuilder. Like this, this body that you built is a shield to the world. And I understand, and people understood that. Like I got as big as I could so that people couldn't hurt, hurt me inside. Uh, but it was okay because like being hurt is, is, is just a part of, of, of the journey that we're all on. And I think for me, the acceptance of other men, when they, when I told them that I was struggling with this, just saying, yeah, dude, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this because I've overcome it as well. So I don't remember the original question, but oh no, it was the journey. What are people, what are people seeking? Uh, for me, it was seeking 
um, wholeness. It was seeking completion. It was seeking the greatest version within me. And I realized in order for me to do that, I really had to evaluate everything that I was doing and participating in. How old are you? I just turned 39 last week. 39, you're not much younger than me. I, I didn't grow up with, uh, we didn't grow up with porn in our hands and in our pockets and on our desktops and following us around wherever we go, like the generation now does, right? Like my son, he just turned 12 years old. I talk to him about this all the time. Uh, that there, there are things on the screen that you're better off avoiding. And so just bring it up because it's ever present. I remember the first time I saw a naked girl. <laughs> it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't scrolling through uh, uh, the, the, the screens. For me, it was so difficult. Uh, I was in the playground at school. This is so weird. I was in the playground at school. And I went just outside the fence. Me and some boys used to go and play in the creek. It was just outside the fence. And one day we're there and we're just playing and a pretty picture caught my eye. And apparently someone had either left or planted a magazine there, maybe hit it. And I guess I must have been maybe in like fifth or sixth grade. And it was like striking gold. Me and my friends were like, oh, and we took it. We looked through it and then we ripped out pages. We put it under our shirt. We went home like we went home quickly. <laughs> we went home quickly and I, I don't even know what we did about it because I don't even think I was m masturbating yet, right? It must have been like maybe 10 years old. So it was just, it was exciting mm -hmm. and it was confusing all, all at the same time. But it never became a malignant issue in my life. Like I'm watching so many young men today because it's, it w for me, it was just a picture. It was just a picture. And it was, and I remember too, like we crumpled it up and like hit it. And so we'd like mm. unfold it and, and it was all crinkly after a little while, several weeks of, of having it and looking at it. But with the screens, you just by a couple touch of the button, all of a sudden there's full blown hardcore porn staring you in your, your face. There's something going on here that is, uh, that's contributing to the degradation and the deleteriation, delete, the deleting of masculinity through this, wouldn't you say? 100%, man. And, 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 and this is, you know, really why we've planted our flag as deeply as we had and why when I do, you know, go on podcasts or I'm given the ability to speak, I always make sure to preface it with the context. Like when we talk about pornography today, we're discussing internet streaming pornography. Yeah, very it's a different drug. It's a different animal. The brain responds different. It's a super normal stimulus. You know, it's interesting, Elliot. I want to I want to touch on one thing you shared there, man, because I think it shows. Um, it gives creed to what you talk about the role of a strong father in the home. So you had mentioned that your introduction came at a schoolyard, like out in a field somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So. Papa Hulse, you know, uh, I, I don't know your dad's name, but I know you've spoken a lot about mm -hmm. him. He obviously didn't have, you know, secret stash that six-year-old Elliot stumbled across. So for me, the introduction came at six years old. Um, you know, being nosy through dad's sock drawer, you pull the socks up underneath that, you realize like dad is hiding some stuff. Um, and, and, and I'm not, and I, and I don't want this to come across as like I'm pointing to my dad right. as the cause for my porn addiction. But what it did do is it showed a young boy that if there's something in your life that you want to hide, it's okay to have secrets mm. from people. And, 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 and that behavior became a reoccurring part of my life. When my parents split up when I was 15 years old, I was an A plus student. I graduated high school 23rd in my class out of almost nice. 500 kids oh, nice. here in Land Lakes, Florida. I was a varsity lettered athlete, multiple sports. Like I was a contributing member in like the school, um, like institutions and things like, you know, different things. I was getting awards and getting recognized, but all at the same time, like I was also selling drugs to the, like the underage kids. I was hosting parties at my house. Like I was running a dual life because at six years old, I learned that it was okay. Like if there's things that you don't want people to know, you just keep them a secret. So I think it's really incredible what you, what you share there. And I think it just shows the power of an influence of a strong father. And it's not always what they say. Many times it's how they do or what they do and how they live that is passed down 
to those kids. Because my dad never had the conversation. I love hearing that you're having conversations with your, your son now. I think that that is important. I think we need to get in front of this. I've had Chris McKenna on the show who runs Protect Young Eyes. He says that when you have kids in the home, pornography should be the most common word. They should know what it is. They should know what it isn't. They should know who they run to when they see it because there will come a time in every young child's life when their brain or when their eyes see something that their brain is not yet developed to handle. So yeah, this this is a problem. This is leading to the degradation of, of young men. It is hijacking hearts, souls, minds. Um, it's impacting relationships. You know, Abigail Shire, um, I don't know if you're familiar with her work. She talks a lot about the transgender community. She, she, she did a conversation with Jordan Peterson. You can find it on Jordan's uh, channel mm -hmm. um, through their work. And I don't, and I don't want to say that, that I'm supporting this, but it's just something I think people can maybe begin to explore. And I know you'll go down a hole here with this. Um, Abigail has shown because the fastest rise in transgenderism right now is in young teenage girls. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think, and, I, and, and one of the things that, that Jordan was able to point to is mm -hmm. that these young boys are seeing it at 11, 12 years old because of age of first exposure is 11 years old. So young boys are seeing it and they're being taught and conditioned that when you love women, when you want to be, when you want to have sex, that's what you're supposed to do is what you're seeing on the screen, the hardcore graphic stuff. I'll share another story here in a minute, but I want to drive this point home. The young girls are seeing it as well. It's like, oh, if men love me, this is what they're, this is what they're going to do mm. to me. And when we think about the abuse, all, 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 all the damaging stuff that is going on in the most popular porn today, right? It's like these young girls are seeing like, why would I ever want to have a man love me if that's what he's going to do? So not pointing at his direct causation and correlation as to this is the cause of it, but there's something going on psychologically in these young girls' minds that like, why would I ever want to grow up and be a beautiful woman? Let me just become a man because of what I'm seeing in the world. Um, there's a story that um, the founder of Fight the New Drug, I'm, I'm sure you're probably familiar with, with their company and organization. So they go out there, raise a lot of awareness, a lot of anti-porn, anti-human trafficking stuff. The founder of Clayton, I heard him speak at an event where he was sharing a story with a family that he knew. Young boy, 12, 13 years old, uh, was excited because he's got his first girlfriend. Girlfriend's coming to the house. They're going to have like a weekend date night at the house. So the parents set up a big projection screen in the driveway kind of be like a drive-in movie at the house with two young kids, 12, 13 years old is, is the age of these kids. So parents set them up in the, in, in the car. They're like, okay, kids, we'll check on you in about an hour. Just make sure to behave and enjoy the movie. When the parents come out to check on him, he's literally leaning over the seat and he's got his hands wrapped around his, her throat and he's strangling her. The parents grab the door and they pull him out. They're like, Johnny, 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 what the hell are you doing? They're like, w w I, I love her. Like, isn't the way that I'm supposed to express my love to her? Because this young boy had been caught up already consuming pornography at 12, 13 years old, thinking that in the act of sex, it's okay to strangle women. Um, so there's a lot going on here, man. And, 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 and this is why I'm passionate about obviously helping the men first that we can help, because we're only going to change the way that it's being passed down to our children when we save the men first. Have you explored the biological changes and chemical changes in the brain that are associated with the consumption of porn? Oh, very, very deeply. Yeah. So I had uh, Dr. Anna Lemke, um, author of uh, Dopamine Nation on the uh, podcast, as well as many other uh, deep, deep neuroscientists. Yeah. So we've explored it very deeply. And so what happens there? Yeah. So, so dopamine, right? Like everybody thinks of dopamine as a chemical of, of pleasure, right? right? You know, you do something makes you feel good. It's like, ah, oh, that, that kind of physical sensation, like that sense of like, ah, like it's, 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 it's dopamine, right? So there's this component of dopamine is tied to pleasure, but dopamine is also a chemical that is directly correlated with our motivation. So from an evolutionary biological perspective, it's there to be dripped out or God put it there for us that to keep us moving and progressing towards our goal. So you and I strength athletes, right? Like if we're, when you're working towards uh, a strength challenge, when you show up to do your lift that day, Little hit of dopamine, right? You know, if you're cutting for a bodybuilding show and you opt to choose the chicken rice over, you know, the donuts and, and fried food, little hit of dopamine. Decision made in correlation with goals beyond yourself that you're moving towards. So an element of motivation. With mm. pornography, though, what happens is first, second exposure, it gives you a super normal hit of dopamine. So like a level 10. Nothing in the natural world is going to produce this. So what ends up happening is now your brain correlates it to, if I want dopamine, 
porn or the consumption of porn will give me a level 10, why would I ever go do anything else? Like, why would I go to the gym? Why would I work on my other goals? So it hijacks our dopamine reward center at a very deep level that puts us in a state where we can only get dopamine or we only feel good when we're in the pursuit of more pornography or when we're in the act of, of consuming it. Because what fires together wires together in, in, in neuroscience. So you have these you have these neurological pathways. I don't get too deep into how the brain works, but the neurons are sending signals back and forth. So it's just constantly communicating. As you and I are talking right now, it's like our brain is firing. Like Frank said that makes me feel this way. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about this thing now. So like so it's just constant communication. Well, when it's hijacked through pornography, it's just sending these super normal stimuluses, you can never experience those normal feelings in the natural world so this is where you, i'm sure you hear from a lot of young men right like they're unmotivated they can't get out of bed they they, they they can't show up for an interview they start a job in three three weeks into it they're like i'm sick and tired and i don't like this or they have these goals and dreams that they want they have ideas but they can't bring it down into actually like taking steps because nothing feels good other than sitting there watching pornography now that's the first half of the cycle the problem though is because they know what they're doing isn't right, right? We talked about at the beginning. Every guy that's consuming pornography, while he may say it's no big deal, he knows deep in his heart, right? Like, like our moral code is written on our heart. He knows deep inside that there's something wrong in what he's doing. So he's chasing it because it makes him feel good. The minute he's completed with it, though, now he's feeling with guilt and shame. So it creates this constant relapse recovery cycle. So, yeah, it hijacks our dopamine uh, motivation and reward center. Just makes us want to not do anything other than go look at and consume more pornography. I was on the call with a, a priest the other day who does marriage prep for families, <clears throat> you know, people who are planning, planning on getting married. And uh, he does this a whole series on masculinity with the men. That's why I was speaking to with him. He's a really smart dude. He recommended this book called Cheap Sex by Mark uh, Regnerus. And uh, within the book, he does a lot of different studies. But along the lines of what you're talking about right there, he says that there's a... a, a a propensity towards depression in men that use pornography and, and it was tied to the dopamine thing as well. I guess, now I don't know this scientifically, but from what I understand that these uh, inordinate or these huge doses of dopamine that happen in the brain then leave you with a low. And so the dopamine receptors or whatever, uh, do, they don't work properly. And so now you're like not just seeking dopamine hits you're in like a dopamine uh deficit efficiency yeah and so then you end up feeling really bad you can't it's not like you get the porn and you feel good and then you don't and then you don't have that good feeling it's like you get the porn you feel good and then you go into a low you go below the normal <laughs> Yeah, this is really at the this is really at the height of of Ivana Lemke's work. Like she talks pretty at length about this, and it's because these neuro these neurochemicals, dopamine, serotonin, every oxytocin, all of them work on a so it's a cycle, right? It's a pain pleasure cycle. So when we do things that bring us dopamine or do things that tied with goals or motivation or pleasure, hit of dopamine. Well, every hit because it's on a cycle. So in order for it to return back to baseline, if it's a cycle, you get a spike. It's gonna have to be followed by a dip. So it's normal, you know, normal would be, I'm gonna use a scale of one to 10. It's not how it works, but I think it's good for explanation purposes. So let's say pornography, because it's super normal, gives you a level 10 hit of dopamine. Going to the gym because it's aligned with your strength goals is maybe like a level three. If you write some sales copy or you're working on an ebook or maybe a course or product, it's like a level seven because it's kind of a bigger goal like outside of yourself, not just your physical goals. So small hits, level three for like doing our physical goals, more purpose-driven goals, level seven. Porn though is gonna be a level 10. Well, if we get a, if we get a spike to a three, it's gonna be followed by a dip, but it's gonna be a dip that's gonna be in correlation to the spike, right? So it's gonna right. go below baseline, but for a very short period of time. Well, if you are constantly spiking at a super normal level, that means those dips into the pain threshold and pain on a dopamine scale is not physical pain like I got punched in the face. No, it's the feelings of depression. It's the feelings of anxiety. It's the fear has taken over control of my life. It's the inability to have meaningful conversations with people. So those are the pain things that we're talking about. So a level 10 pleasure is gonna obviously bring me to a level 10 pain now if you're caught up in a cycle or you're you know your compulsive user where it's three four five times a day you're getting level 10 level 10 level 10 level 10 
Well, obviously you're going to be in a deficient stamp. You're going to be in a deficient state because you haven't given your body ample time to reset, to return back to baseline. So at, at speaking, just giving some, you know, some, some scientific, you know, support to, to what you're talking about there. That's why, because dopamine works in a, in a cycle. So every hit that you get is going to be followed by uh, a dip. That's why when we're feeling the urge to go get pornography, instead of satisfying it, instead of seeking the instant gratification, if you could sit in it, if you could endure the pain a little bit, a little bit of discomfort long enough, that will result in you having some type of pleasure on the back end side of those things. It's just, are men willing to be discomfort or dis discomfortable long enough? It sounds almost like overcoming any addiction. <clears throat> you know, uh, if, you're, if yeah. you're coming off of alcohol or marijuana or uh, even video games, uh, my son, just to be completely transparent, he, he loves video games. I mean, I liked them when I was a kid, too. I never really got hooked on them, but he plays a lot more video games than I did. And so he'll go on detoxes. And I'll say, you know, he, he, mm. he chooses. Hey, I'm going to take a, a fast. And uh, the, <laughs> the mantra is during those time when he's fasting is to embrace the boredom because it's so uncomfortable. It, it's almost a physical discomfort when you're not getting that that high, that dopamine hit that you're just you're describing, just like anybody coming off of any drugs, would you say? Absolutely. Now, is he doing that himself, or is that you coaching coaching him? It's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's a little bit okay. of both. I make suggestions I mean, and offer education, yeah, that, and every once in a while, he'll know it's time, and so he'll take a break. No, it's incredible level of self awareness for for such a young man. Um, no, this is an important you know discussion topic, right? It's 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 because a lot of men, it's like, yeah, I'm going to stop porn, but then they're spending six hours a day on YouTube, or right. you know, six hours a day playing video games, or you know, eight hours consuming TikTok. It's you haven't actually you know tried to solve the problem. You just replaced the stimulus uh, from pornography with with something else, and oftentimes all that's going to do is it's going to lead you back to wanting more pornography because with social media while butt pictures on instagram or you know some videos on youtube can make you feel good like you're getting a little bit of pleasure we know it's not going to compare to what you're going to get on pornography so your brain is going to trick you into thinking like yeah you're coming over here you're getting these hits it's almost like an edge effect right it's like you're going to get to the edge the edge the edge most addicts aren't strong enough to get to the edge without eventually having to fall all the way off the cliff so I would definitely say for for the men that are that are listening and watching this and and this conversation is ringing true to your life if you're going to begin to work towards removing pornography i would advise cutting social media cutting video games cutting all that stuff out for a minimum 30 60 days you know just get that detox and and, and oftentimes just a dopamine detox like dr anna lemke talks about in her book just 30 to 60 days of just a full reset and wow. and, and cleanse will put you in a position where you can now get back into social media. You can get back into navigating the apps. Obviously, never returning back to porn, uh, but you'll be able to use these things for, for good as opposed to having them use you. The key here, from what I'm understanding, is you got to build up your ability or your tolerance for pain. You got to build up your ability to suffer. And that's definitely one of the things that, are, that men today are, are di not facing. Uh, yeah. According to Father Ripperger, he uh, or not Father Ripperger, he quotes uh, Thomas Aquinas. He says the uh, definition of effeminacy is the uh, is the attachment to pleasure and the avoidance of challenge. And so, anytime you're avoiding a little bit of struggle, avoiding a little bit of pain, avoiding getting a little uncomfortable, and staying cozy with your little cuddly thing that keeps you feeling good that you're exhibiting signs of effeminacy. And so for a man to overcome that natural tendency towards effeminacy, it's in with, within all of us. I mean, it started in the garden with Adam. Rather than telling his wife no, he kind of just was like, oh, I'll just go along with you, because it was easier. It, it's easier, there's no, there's no pushback, there's no struggle. In fact, hey, it, it, the writer says he just wanted to be with his wife. His answer was, I just wanted to be with my wife. It's almost like the guy who just wants his, uh, wants his mommy, wants his binky, wants his uh, weed, or wants his video game, or wants his porn. But we have to uh, allow ourselves to really get comfortable being uncomfortable, is what I hear you saying. 100%, man. I have, a, I have another friend that runs a similar you know, ministry as, as, as to mine, um, husband material. He actually talks about, and he's described it as porn is 
your pacifier. Like that's, that, that, yeah. that's it. And that's what I talked about at the beginning, right? When I realized early on, it's like, I'm not helping men quit porn. Like that's, 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 that's very low level. That's surface level stuff. Like we got to get to the heart of what these men's issues are and realizing like you're running to pornography, drugs, sex, gambling, video games, whatever the case may be. You're running because there's a hole inside of you. Let's identify what that is and then let's fill that back up. And then through that, you're gonna be able to, you know, to conquer this thing. And this is why it's been, you know, it's been so amazing with, with yours and I's relationship, right? It's like we met in 2017 and then in 2019, I started down this journey. I got to watch you from the sidelines going down your uh, your fasting journey, you know, we talked a lot about on on the first podcast that you and I did. That's become an integral part of my journey. I, I, I really feel that me starting fasting. So as a bodybuilder, like fasting was never something I even thought of. Like, what do you mean? I can't I can't not Taboo. eat every three hours. I'm going to lose all my gains, bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, but it was funny. It was actually the, so I think it was Hurricane um, Irma, whichever one was in late 2018, we had a hurricane in, in South Florida. It shut the gyms down for two days and that pissed me off. It was like, what do you mean the hurricane's coming? We can't go to the gym. I was like, well, if I can't work out, I'm going to not eat. And it was something where it was like, I'd wanted to try fasting and here was like the ideal opportunity for me to try it. So I did a two day fast in late 2018. I was like, oh, I feel really good. Like not eating. Like I feel mentally clear. I felt a lot better on day two. Um, so when I started down this journey with porn, so that was before the porn journey. It was like, I just got some success with fasting and I really liked it. When I started, you know, a couple months later in February, 2019, fasting became an integral part of the recovery, it became a massive part of, of my life. I was doing intermittent fasting. Um, I went about four months where I was doing one meal a day. So OMAD, um, and I was doing two day, three day, and I got up to five day fasting. And it's now become a part of our coaching curriculum early on. It's like, you yeah, need to right. go get discomfort uh in the first two weeks and it's in that discomfort period that we actually have you cast the vision for your for your life but yeah if we can't learn to inject some discomfort and i think for me this is why when i decided to quit i i wrestled with this man because it wasn't hard like i made a decision that i'm removing pornography out of my life and pornography returning back into my life was never an option now yes i had been disciplined i had been putting myself in discomfortable situations for 10 years, getting sub 5% body fat and competing in a bodybuilding show <laughs> is very uncomfortable, Yeah, very uncomfortable. Um, and I think for me, there was a lot of character development and building that came out of that process uh, in my in my career journey in, in bodybuilding that led to what I was able to do uh, with porn and porn recovery. But yeah, men today, it's, it's, we, we live in a microwave society, man. You know, you're hungry, you push a food, you know, you push a button, food shows up to your door. You know, you want some sex, you go on, you know, you swipe left, you swipe right. You know, if, if, if you, you have, you know, th three looks and five personality, like you're going you're, you're gonna to score, man. So it's a very easy society that we live in. So we need to be able to inject some of the discomfort into our own lives. There are people uh, that believe that pornography is in fact a weapon. And if you ever get a chance to watch some of the videos of E. Michael Jones uh, when he speaks about libido dominandi, it was a tool used to soften a society by making the men weak and docile so that they could be easily manipulated and uh, controlled. And he tells stories about how they uh, pornography was weaponized during certain wars. And he talks about you know the, the Israeli Palestinian conflict and how well once the Israelis took over the TV stations in Palestine the very first thing that they did was they shut down all the TV stations put one station on so they could only watch one thing and just flooded it with 24 hours a day of pornography and it wasn't because they were trying to help the guys out and make them feel good about being at home in fact in part of it it's so funny because a part of that you know there were it was a war so people were staying in the, indoors. So you're forced to stay indoors and you're forced to watch a TV that has only one channel, which is pornography. And they knew what they were doing. It seems almost as if that same exact thing had happened during 2020. Because from what I remember during the COVID lockdowns, Pornhub had skyrocketed in, its, uh, in, in the visitors to its site. And it started doing all sorts of like, um, freebie deals and stuff like that because they knew that all these men were going to be locked in their homes and they could weaponize this pornography 
to just make them weaker and more docile and more easily controllable. 100% man. Um, that's exactly what what happened, right? So, you know, we told the lockdown. And then I think within the first couple of days, it was like Pornhub free, you know, free premium porn for everybody while you're while you're isolated and locked up, just consume all the, you know, all the free stuff that you could possibly want. You know, it's interesting because when you when you look at society, you look at the world, man, and it's just you see the transgenderism, you see the drag queen story time, mm -hmm. um, you see the um, minor attracted persons, you know, AKA you mean pedos? I should go put my pedophile hat, hunter hat on. Um, you know, when we think about like what all this is doing is this is just conditioning in a society that like all of these terms and topics and consumption of all this is just going to be okay. You know, the, the number one search term in pornography is teen. Like there's, 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 there's no, like there's a direct correlation between that and then the minor attracted or the acceptance of pedophilia. It's all we're just trying to condition just to make it accepted and make this become the new normal now whatever you know whatever the bigger agenda is like that's kind of probably outside of my um you know area of of, of expertise but um no we've, we've 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 seen it and once again it's just given me more fuel to plant our flag even deeper and continue to have these conversations uh in in one of his documentaries or interviews he talks about how this is the, the whole porn uh culture has sort of been slowly infiltrating our culture for probably like since the end of the 1950s and that we've been looking at you know increasingly increasingly harder porn that starts soft right so i think about like watching like beverly hills 90210 when i was a kid right like in the 1990s and you know if there if there are reruns or something like that you can go back and watch them it was just it was almost like very innocent soft <laughs> sort of uh what's the word it starts with an i like innuendo sort of mm. sexual uh teasing but now like uh, during the halftime shows at the nfl we lit we have like literal nakedness and pornography and we've got like little nas x uh giving blowjobs to satan it's been a slippery slope <laughs> it's been a slippery slope since the 19, just even just the 1990s. Where do you think we're going? Uh, you know, I have my opinion about where, what's next, but how far can the pendulum swing? Yeah, man, and when you understand the brain and science and, and, and how all that works, so there was a study done in, I believe it was done in the 70s out of, out of Stanford, and it was, it was done on butterflies. Um, I don't have the, the researcher scientist name, I can pull that up if anybody wants it, uh, but they were studying butterflies in their natural environments, and they wanted to, under, they wanted to get a better understanding of butterfly um, mating, mating behavior. And so butterfly, male of butterfly attraction is to size of the wings, colors, um, and I believe the size of the eyes. So there's kind of three indicators. So large wings from the female butterfly, very bright, vibrant, bright, vibrant colors, and kind of the, like the, the, the boldness of her eyes. Those are the physical attractions. What these scientists did is they had created this, uh, this ecosystem of butterflies, natural habitats, but it was all being able to obviously be, uh, to be studied. What they started doing, they started uh, injecting fake butterflies into this ecosystem bigger wings brighter colors more mm. vibrant eyes over time all the male butterflies started going to these and they stopped mating with the real butterflies so it's like you know, anime. No yeah yeah right so it's it's the desensitization effect right you know with any addiction like the more you get into it the deeper and deeper it goes the more of that substance the more hardcore of that substance you need this is why marijuana was a gateway not because everybody that does smokes weed is going to end up a crackhead but you don't end up a crackhead oftentimes without having gone through some type of other gateway gateway tunnel yeah you know same things with same things with with alcohol addiction right if a guy is is down in a fifth of whiskey every single night there's been some progression in that man's life obviously his life has gotten worse but also the need for the drug has increased so with pornography, yeah, we may, you know, my my exposure was to a magazine, was to a 2G, to a 2D image. Like over time, though, I was definitely consuming things that wouldn't really be too proud to share. It's because my brain had been desensitized, so I needed more and more and more. So there's obviously, there's no surprise that just the world 
is more acceptance to sex sexual acts on 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 tv like you mentioned nas x and humping the ground or you know blowing satan or whatever he's doing out there there's a reason why because like we're all just accepting this in our life so where does it where does it lead to i mean they're already selling sex robots they're already you know having sex with 3d headsets on i think we're just we're just gonna go further down that hole yeah yeah I, I I tend to believe that the pendulum is at its peak. I, I can't imagine it getting much weirder. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a split and ultimately a return to tradition for a lot of people. I mean, even the presence of a person like you, I don't think five years ago there were people that were out there helping men overcome. In fact, it was such a shameful thing that no one would even bring it up. I think this generation, part of the problem is this lack of shame. Uh, mm. I remember, you know, when I was in middle school and whatnot, and when boys start jerking off, it was a quiet thing. We really didn't, we didn't bring it up. We kind of knew or we joke on the sly with one another. But now it's the, I'm getting emails or there's entire YouTube channels and like everybody's just straight out in the open about pornography and masturbation addiction and all these things that at one point maybe, maybe it wasn't so good that it was undercover. But now that it's out, it has to be confronted, it has to be dealt with, and I see people dealing with it, and dealing with it in a way that is, is mature and overcoming. And, and you know, they say hard times create strong men. I think this is the generation that's facing the hard times that are gonna create mm. strong men. You know, it, it doesn't have to be bombs and bullets dropping at your front door to be living in a, in a hard time. We're living in, a, we're living in a faithless time. We're looking at a time where marriage and family doesn't work. We're looking at a time where uh, addiction to all kinds of diabolical things, not just drugs, uh, pervade and, and and are ever present in the lives of of men and, and people. So I can I I can't help but to believe uh, or have hope that we're at we're going to be seeing a, a big turnaround here pretty soon. What do you think? Yeah, no, and I think I would definitely I think I would definitely agree with you. You know, I think I I was trying to answer the question in a way that if we don't fix it and solve it, this is where it could potentially yeah. lead. Right, but you know, I've been you know I've been at the forefront of leading this conversation. For a little over three years yeah. now and I've, i have even just seen an acceptance and the willingness for people to talk to me about it right so um it definitely has you know has grown and it's become much more accepted you're seeing more people like myself uh rise up you're seeing more you know coaches out there you're seeing more uh more programs um you know it's been interesting because you know you, we've, we've talked about on Olemke's book you know a handful of times like dr on Olemke has sat down with joe rogan um, you know, million plus people have heard that she opens up her uh, her book with her personal story from a physician, you know, not not a physician, but she's a psychologist. So from an expert trained in the field, struggled with a female's version of of pornography. So I think hearing it more discussed out there. Um, you know, I have another great friend, Josh Joshua Broom. Josh was one of the male. Uh, he was one of the leading porn stars in the world. He actually won the honor for male performer of the world. Um, and the night he was supposed to get his award, he was at home contemplating suicide. Um, he's now turned his life around. He's He's got an incredible movement. He's a pastor, huge platform. He's been on Tucker Carlson. Uh, so we're seeing the conversation accepted more more mainstream now, and it's no longer layered with when I go on a show, hey guys, we're gonna have the taboo sub, you know, conversation that nobody wants to talk about. So I agree with you, man. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely an eternal optimist. I think we are seeing a turn for, for the better. Um, and once again, man, not to keep you know talking about planting my flag here, but that's why I have planted it as deeply as I could, because right. I did see, and I was having this conversation with somebody earlier today, man. You know, I think if you go back to 2015, 17, even when I was getting into it, man, like even it was very taboo. It was not talked about a, a, a lot. And when it was, what type of men did you think about? You thought about like weak, you know, weak men, like living at home in their mom's basement. Like can't hold a job down. He's got, you know, he's got tomato sauce on his chin 24 <laughs> hour days a week, you know? And it's like, for me, it was like, no, that's not the case, man. Like I, like I said, I, gone out and conquered some things in the world man i had some worldly success whatever that means right. to people it doesn't matter but from a projection of like you can have your life together and still be struggling with a porn addiction that was one of the biggest messages that i wanted to share with the world because i truly think that it could help a lot of people so what do you say to a man who's watching this right now and he's admitting to himself i do i think i have a problem i have a pornography problem What's the first step to overcoming this? 
Well, once you've admitted to yourself, the next the next step has to be admitting it to to another person. Oh, you know, yeah. wh- 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 where does shame where does shame come from? You know, shame is you telling yourself you're a bad person for what you're doing. Guilty is you're a good person that does some bad things. So if you're not talking about it, if you're holding it back because you're concerned with the judgment of other people. So if I say this is this person, they're going to judge me on who I am, not on what I'm doing, but they're going to judge me. That means that I'm worried about my behavior. That means I'm layered with shame. Well, how do we need to get out of that? We have to find the strength and courage to talk about it. So once you've admitted it to yourself, the next step, man, is literally admitting it to somebody else. Now, make sure it's the right person, though. Make sure it's somebody that you feel safe with. Make sure it's somebody that is true, you can truly trust. It shouldn't be your wife. It shouldn't be your girlfriend. Um, ideally, uh, a, a, a man, older, mentor, coach, pastor, somebody that holds an authority position, and somebody that when you look at them, how they live, the character that they hold, you're like, I want to be like that guy. Because here's what's going to happen is you're going to go shared with him. Granted, he's the right person, and it's a safe place to have the real conversation. He's going to put his arm around you and say, you know what, E? I get that, man. And I dealt with that same thing, too. And I had to overcome it in my life before I got where I was today. So once you've admitted to yourself, find somebody in your life that you truly trust and just have that open conversation with them. That reminds me of a technology I saw recently. You know, I, for a while there, I was looking for different uh, filters, uh, Wi-Fi filters, blockers for any and every aspect of my home. And I came across one that was uh, about overcoming pornography, but it, but it was associated with a friend. Like it, mm. the technology would only work if you had someone to be accountable to. I forget what it was called, but the minute you Covenant said that, Eyes? Maybe that's it. I know that's one I, of them I think, that I looked I, into. I think so, yeah, that's the one. So, so that's the only one that I've decided to promote, support. We've partnered with them um, because of that, because of that piece, right? You know, normal blocker, normal software, if there's nobody else tied to it, if you want the drug bad enough, if you put the if you put the blocker on, you know how to take it off. Sure. Um, so that's why a lot of those things don't work. But when there's an external person, so there's three types of accountability, righty? You have your own personal, like self accountability. This is your ability to self regulate, to have discipline, and 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 hold off on doing the things you want now because you know that the bigger you know, bigger reward waiting for you in the future. So self accountability, all men struggling with porn need to learn to develop that. There's peer accountability though too. Like I'm sure this is what they get inside your King's program. This is what they get in the comment section down here as well. It's like when you're working and you're going down a journey with other men, the peer accountability is incredibly powerful because it's like, hey, I'm not the only one struggling with this. Right. If you're struggling with self accountability though, the only way you're gonna develop the self accountability is through expert or external accountability. So you need somebody that's kind of already transcended this himself is kind of outside of the struggle. So the peers are in the struggle with you. The extra to the ex or, or the external accountability is kind of outside of it. And they can see and navigate and they can say, Hey, man, three weeks on the road, like you need to be worried with this. When you said this thing this way, I understand what you were thinking. But let's reframe your language here a little bit. So if you want to improve your self accountability, you need to get some external accountability to help you. Um, and we've all experienced this in our life, you know, you you got kids, obviously, and at one point you were a child as well. I was when we were kids, though. Like our parents had to tell us to brush our teeth, right? It's like every night right. before you go to bed, eat, go brush your teeth. Like I don't want to. I want to have stinky breath when I go to bed. Whatever the case may be. But now, when you're in your 40s, like you don't, your mom doesn't have to call you every night to say, Elliot, make sure you brush your teeth. Right. No, you have an internal habit that was created though through years and years and years of external accountability. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's so important, man, that we have to get in conversations and community and get some help outside of ourselves. Because if we're struggling with the self accountability or the self regulation, the only way we're going to be able to build that and create that in our life is by having some form of external that's going to be able to walk us through, coach us through, and help us in that process of building that up in our life. So if I could boil this down to three steps, just based on our conversation here, it sounds like step one is you got to admit you have a problem, right? Isn't that what they do in AA? Hey, my yep. name's Elliot Hulse. I'm an addict, alcoholic, or I'm an addict, or whatever it is. So the very first, the thing only is caveat, that, yeah, the only caveat there from from AA. I've spoken a lot about this. I love it. I'm not knocking anything okay. they've done. They've done more <laughs> good for addiction. The problem I have is the identifying as 
an addict. Oh. I'm a big believer in we have the ability to change our identity, and that is actually sitting at the center of our work as we take you through the process of becoming the man that is no longer addicted to porn. So accept it first, take the responsibility, but don't continue to label yourself as an addict because that is you putting a limiting belief in front of yourself that you'll never be able to fully transcend it and, mm -hmm. and, and overcome it and become the man that no longer struggles with it. But yes, personal responsibility is, is definitely the first step in any transformational change is right. I don't like where I'm at right now. I'm the reason that I'm here, but I'm also the person that's going to be able to get me out of it. And then number two would be what you just said about confessing, essentially. Yep. Confess yep. to a mentor, to an elder, to someone that can hold you accountable. Yep, Con confession and, and then the, the recruitment of the accountability. So that second step is kind of, it's, it's, it's a two part, right? It's like, I just don't want to talk about what I've right. done. This is a problem with, with a lot of, like I see it in, you know, in, in, in Christianity. It's like, it's like uh, yeah, I sinned this week. Yeah, I sinned this week. Well, well, where's the person correcting you? Where's the person holding you accountable to not do the stupid sin again next week? So just don't, just don't accept that you have a problem and admit it, recruit the accountability that now we're going to change this together. Mm -hmm. Resolve to sin no more. That's what Jesus mm. says, right? He says, okay, fine. Just go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So sin no more. So that's it. So we got self-awareness, self uh, uh, confession and accountability. And then step three is kind of where we started, which is vigilance, right? Your ability to suffer through the, the detox. Like you got to be yeah. willing to be uncomfortable. That's, a, that's, a, that's really where the vigilance comes in. I think a lot of people think that, oh, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do something great. And maybe they do even tell somebody, but then the, the how you would say, final perseverance, the perseverance is really where the work is, is done. Yeah, well, I mean, just to maybe say that a little bit differently, like it's the difference between being interested in something and truly committed to it, right? You know, um, a lot of people are interested in having, you know, a million subscribers on YouTube, righty? Like a lot of people would be like, yeah, like I want to have a million subscribers, but are they willing to do what Elliot Hulse did, which was put a video on YouTube every single day for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years, you, 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 you did it? You know, a lot of people want to be a strong man, but are they willing to carry the load to, to endure the suffering. A lot of people want to be sub 5% body fat and stand on a bodybuilding show. Uh, are they willing to do it? Are they interested or are they truly committed? A lot of men are interested in removing pornography out of life because they know it's a problem. They're not truly committed to the suffering and the diligence of doing what's necessary. Because yeah, those first two steps can be accomplished in literally 30 minutes. Like you can have a radical wake up moment uh, take responsibility for yourself, call one of your buddies, confess to him, recruit the accountability. All that can be done in the blimp of a moment, right? right. Here within 30 minutes, you've now accomplished those first two steps. That third step may be three months for some men. It may be six months. It may be a year, depending upon where you're at. It's just how much development do you need to, to build up in yourself and how much pain are you going to have to sit in? And a lot of that is just due to how long have you been chasing the discomfort without any form of pain in your life. Once again, for me, I made the decision in a moment. I recruited the accountability right then and there. And then it was three months of me rebooting and rewiring. But I had been conditioned to do uncomfortable things. Yeah. I, had, I had set out and, and said I'm going to accomplish multiple big goals in my life. So the failing as uh, aspect of quitting porn was never an option. I just, know, I just had no clue how quickly or how long it was going to take for me to fully overcome it. And for me, it was about three months. And you also mentioned uh, covenant eyes as a piece of technology mm -hmm. that can be used to help you through that struggle and have accountability from a partner, correct? Yeah, yeah, so Covenant Eyes, the way that works is, is you, you, you go in, you set up your account, right then there at activation, you assign accountability partner, they get notified, email acceptance, and then you two together will build out the profile. And it's constantly pulling screenshots. I think you put a list of sites that you can't go to, but then it pulls random shots through your browser history throughout the day. And at the end of the day, your, your accountability partner or buddy gets a report. So I would know where he was. You know, I would know what he was on, what images, was he, was he looking at what videos was he trying to or not trying to, to, to consume? So yeah, accountability um, softwares can be used. I don't think it's the cure-all. I, I think it's a tool in the toolbox to recovery though. And maybe you could share your experience or some of the experiences of the men that you've coached. 
what can someone who's willing to confront this and do something about it expect on the other end? Uh, how will their life be better if they overcome pornography addiction? Yeah, I can give a couple, you know, a couple of stories because I think it, I think it depends on where where the guy is in life and what he wants to improve. Like you can improve anything if you're willing to put the work and effort into it. Um, you know, so our, our program, we've seen guys in four months, radical fitness transformation. So I worked with a pastor that came in. Um, he was struggling with belief because like self-belief, like not, not belief from like a Christian perspective. Like he knew, you know, Jesus was the son of God and he, you know, he believed all that. He struggled with like, can I actually do this? Cause I've been trying to overcome this for so long. Yeah. Um, so he, he built self-belief in and of himself. Um, and he lost 21 pounds, got shredded six pack, put on a ton of strength in, in his upper body because yeah. other areas of his life were, were going really like pretty well. Like he was leading a ministry. He had an incredible family. So for him, when he came in, I said, okay, we need to have something that we, that we need to work on outside of pornography. So in our curriculum, this is where we actually, we help you set the goal of what's going to improve. So when we do that fast in week two, we paint a vision for your life five years into the future without pornography. So you and I would sit here today, Elliot, and think like if you were struggling with pornography and it's been in your life for 10 years, if you were able to go the next five years without it, what could you produce or what would you want to produce? So your life improves in the ways that you want it to, uh, depending upon what vision you set for yourself. I mean, we can, we can give some of the, you know, like the general um, outcomes, like improved relationships, built, you know, the, the self-confidence and belief in and of yourself. That's, that's probably the biggest thing that men struggle with is the confidence and, and belief. So once they begin to get some success in this area of your life, we take that confidence and direct it into your fitness. Boom, you're now confident in your ability to change your body. We take that confidence and direct it into your fitness. Boom, you're now confident you can go out and start the business, launch the business. We've had guys that are online fitness coaches have their biggest months ever. We've had guys launch new businesses over the course of four months. Um, relationships. So you've struggled with building meaningful relationships due to lack of self-confidence and belief. Once we start building some of those traits up in you, boom, we direct your confidence to your relationship. Now you're a man that can go out and build meaningful, lasting relationships. So your life improves in all the areas. It's just dependent upon where did you want to direct that focus. And, and that's what we'll walk you through in our, in our, in our, in our program. But yeah, I think improved confidence, um, improved self-belief, the ability to create meaningful relationships, mental clarity, focus, motivation, as you reset your, your dopamine center, um, a, a, a new sense of joy for, for life in a sense of peace. Um, cause you're no longer keeping secrets from people. Amazing. And so for my viewers who are watching this and they're intrigued, they're ready to get started. They want to overcome their addiction to pornography and maybe you're the guy to help them what resources of yours would you point them to? Yeah, well, we have a free, uh, a free book. It's a seven step guide uh, to living life without porn. Um, so those three that we, that we talked about, I mean, that's, that's in there. That actually is one, two, three, but we'll take you through four, five, six, and, nice. and seven, and just kind of extensions. Cause once we, you know, we really narrowed it. Like once you're on that third step, there's some involvement in there. Like how do you actually reset, reboot your brain? How do you kind of get, you know, these neurochemicals working your advantage? So the seven step guide to living life without porn would probably be the best resource for anybody. Um, you can find that at the seven step guide.com. Um, just put your email in and well, it's, it's, it's a free download right away. Um, the guys on YouTube, check out our YouTube channel. It's coach Frank Rich. Um, every day we drop one video and one short, um, and then check me out on Instagram. It's coach, coach Frank Rich as well. That's amazing, man. You're doing amazing work as well. And it's been a pleasure to have you here on the show, dude. I appreciate your brother. Thank you, man. You got it until next time, Frank.